What if you were asked to save someone's life? Somebody you don't even know. Could you do it? My name is Serena Marshall and I am an unrelated bone marrow donor. About a year ago, I signed up with the National Bone Marrow Registry. Now, is this going to feel weird at all when nope. it starts? Nope. I interviewed a sickle cell anemia patient for work who was part of a clinical trial and underwent a bone marrow transplant. And he told me that it saved his life. And after speaking to him and hearing his story, I realized that I could do that for somebody. And eight months later, I got the call. Step one, preliminary physical to confirm match. It was about a week after I received the notice that I was a potential donor that they brought me in to do some preliminary tests. You are our number one concern. And then this is Sarah. She's my donor advocate. That basically means that she's looking out for my best interest throughout the entire process. So today I'm just going to do a blood draw. Here we go. <laughs> and in case you couldn't tell, I hate needles. I've been matched to a 61-year-old man suffering from myodysplastic disorder, precursor to leukemia. There's no rhyme or reason. It's just you have to be that perfect match. Because I had matched with an older patient, they requested that I do a peripheral stem cell collection. That means they will collect the stem cells they find circulating in my blood through a process called apheresis. It's sort of like donating plasma, but not. Step two, get a complete physical. Things good on our end, the donor's been cleared, consents have been signed, and only at that point can the patient begin that preparative regimen. When that patient starts that treatment, there's really no turning back for the patient. To be considered a match, you have to have a five out of six for the proteins that they test for. It turned out that I was a six out of six match. Interesting. The better the match, the better the outcome. So we're gonna admit you as an outpatient here at the clinical center, and then get you a chest x-ray. Roll your shoulders forward. EKG. Squiggle, squiggle, wave, wave. As long as they're not flat, you're doing good. <laughs> then we take you to the Department of Transfusion Medicine's Dowling Clinic, where you're going to be seen by one of the DTM fellows. And then they're going to do a physical. Step three, Bill Grastom shots. So today's day one of my shots. I'm getting Bill Grastom, which will help stimulate bone marrow production into my bloodstream, which is how they will collect the bone marrow in five days. And there's a blood draw today. Oh, and another blood draw today. <laughs> Throughout the process, multiple blood draws were necessary to check for everything from the matched donor to recipient proteins to diseases, as well as to make sure I was not pregnant. Outside of a slight burning feeling at the site of the shot afterwards, the filgrastum felt pretty comparable to any other shot I've ever received. Over the next three days, Sarah came to my house and work to check my vitals and give me the shots. She told me to expect headaches or bone pain and muscle aches similar to a cold or the flu as a result of the shots. The donation day had finally arrived and I was definitely ready to go. I had found out at my physical that the veins where they normally do apheresis were too small, so they'd have to give me a femoral line, which only occurs in less than 10% of cases. But before this could be done, I needed to get my last and final shot. At this point, my donation went from textbook to problematic, as the doctor in the surgical ICU had trouble placing my line. So they brought me down to interventional radiology where I met Dr. Wood. They got the line placed with no problem. Then I was back on my way to Apheresis Clinic for the blood collection. Getting ready to get hooked up to the machine that will collect the blood and put it back in at the same time. Throughout the collection, I had a nurse assigned to me to make sure that nothing would go wrong and I was as comfortable as could be expected. Sarah, say hi. Hello. Okay, so blood is going to come out right here. Nurse Sarah was really good about explaining to me what was happening as it was happening. It's going to actually enter the centrifuge here. That's where the blood is separating. Um, and what happens is it's a continuous flow centrifuge, so blood is going in and out of you all at the same time. At any time. point, I only have 200 milliliters of blood out of my body at a time, which is less than half of what you do during a blood donation. After hours of collection, they finally had enough stem cells to send the patient, so it was time to take me off the machine and transport the blood stem cells to the patient, wherever he is. Before it started, I'd ask myself, if I was given the opportunity to save someone else's life, would I be able to? My dad's 61. I hope that if he was going through something like this, that somebody would be there to help him. So, About a month after the donation, I received word that my cells had engrafted and the patient was going home from the hospital. Well, I guess I was able to save someone else's life, and if asked, I would do it again. For information on how to register, 
visit www.marrow.org. Department of Health and Human Services, USA, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, www.cancer.gov slash cancer topics slash bone dash marrow dash transplant 1-800-4-CANCER produced May 2011